Good evening, JCPS parents and family. We are so excited to have you here tonight for our presentation. My name is Jenny Stiff, and I am an academic instructional coach in the gifted office for JCPS. And tonight I'm gonna to be talking about creativity and giftedness and what that means in JCPS and using the state law to help guide our thinking this evening. Here's my contact information. I will be presenting for about half an hour. And if you think of a question after the presentation tonight, feel free to email me. So we have four things to cover in our short half an hour presentation on creativity this evening. The first one is how do we identify in creativity in JCPS. Then I will touch on services. Once your child has been formally identified, we have to provide services and I'll talk about some of those opportunities. And then we will look at what you can do outside of the school day for creativity. There are lots of options for kids. And then of course, I'll be providing resources for parents to help you develop creativity at home. So I'm gonna start with a quote um, that I heard from Sir Ken Robinson. I've linked in this presentation one of my favorite TED Talks and it's called Do Schools Kill Creativity? And so I'll let you read this quote while I read it to you. Curiosity is a prerequisite for creative thinking. Creativity thrives in young children, but tends to diminish during school years. It is educated out of them. And so my friends at WKU have convinced me that I have a bit of creativity in me. And so I'm gonna share a personal story about my own school. And just to kind of show you some of this that's happening. Now, I went to school a while ago, but creativity really wasn't happening in schools back when that 90s, when I was in high school, late 80s, 90s. And so when I got to um, high school, I was fairly bored in my comprehensive classes. And so I did take the advanced program test. And then of course, I did not do well enough to score to be placed into the advanced program class. And um, my mom tells this story better than I do, but apparently I went to my school counselor. I asked her to see the results because I wanted to see which questions I missed. I have a tendency to want to argue myself into correct answers. It's a very common characteristic of high school students with creativity. I questioned everything. I wanted to argue about why this answer could be right versus this other answer. And of course, um, they did not listen. They would not show me my test results. I think my mom maybe got to see them, but that was just one small example. From that point in high school, I was pretty much a C student. I was pretty bored in my comprehensive classes and I only put effort into the classes that mattered to me or that I felt emotionally connected with the teacher. So that's just something really important to know that creativity doesn't always show up on the intellectual side of things. Um, they definitely have high achieving ability and their IQs tend to be above the average mean of 100, but typically it's nothing like some of us think in the general intellectual gifted areas. And so that's just a little story for you today. I encourage you if you have time to watch that TED talk, it's excellent. So just to help parents out, we do use the Kentucky Department of Education's definition of creativity. And it is creative or divergent thinking ability means possessing either potential or demonstrated ability to perform at an exceptionally high level in creative thinking and divergent approaches to conventional tasks. And I've highlighted some of the words that I wanna bring your attention to for parents. First of all, they use the word divergent thinking, and we're gonna clarify that for you on the next slide. But I also want you to know that it's exceptionally high level. When we're talking about gifted education, we still want the child to be creatively gifted. So exceptionally high level parents is something I want you to think about. And then I also like to point out the potential. Oftentimes creative abilities can be stifled by the educator, the task, the students, the student interest. Uh, creatively gifted students are very driven from their heart. They want to be emotionally connected to things and then you'll see them thrive. And they tend to view the world a little bit differently. So the old cliche thinking outside of the box is somewhat true. 
So we used that word divergent thinking on the previous slide. And so let's break down what that means in the creative world. Divergent thinking has four sub categories, fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. So parents, when we're screening your children for identification and creativity, we're measuring their ability to do these four things. Fluency is a student with many ideas. They can come up with them typically very quickly and they can generate lots and lots of ideas. Brainstorming is pretty common classroom um, activity that would really cater to a creative mind. Flexibility, that's the types of ideas you generate. Um, originality is probably what most of us think about when we think of creativity. That's the unusual or novel ideas. And then of course, elaboration is pretty much what it sounds like. The student can add details and elaborate on things. So I like to put it for parents concretely. So my next slide here is about concretely creative. And these are some characteristics of the creatively gifted. And I just want you to peruse this list Maybe think about your own children or other children you've seen or yourself. And I want you to just take a look. These are very common characteristics research has shown to show up in students who are creatively gifted. And I don't know about you, but some of these don't have the most positive connotations. And so it's important to realize that depending on your student, your child, yourself, sometimes it can be seen very positively by risk taking and then other times teachers can view it as being stubborn or rebellious. One of my other most memorable moments from being a first grader was the teacher asked us to create a pattern. And um, that was the directions. She did not, I reminded her as a first grader, say create a numerical pattern. She just said, I want you to create a pattern. And I took the time to make this beautiful, it was color coded with shapes and it was a pattern. But I did not go two, four, six, eight, three, six, nine, twelve. I didn't skip count. I didn't do by fives. I made mine colorful and shape driven. And she called my mom. She told me I was arguing with her. I was being uncooperative. I was questioning her rules because I truly just thought it was a pattern. I was doing what I was told. And just that little misinformation between communication pieces is sometimes can happen. So I got, you know, in trouble for just doing what I thought was following the rules. That always hasn't been the case, by the way. I've had lots and lots of positive experiences too, but sometimes the creatively gifted can be misunderstood by teachers. So in JCPS, we recommend in the gifted office that you be inclusive when identifying in creativity. So our first recommendation is a whole school screener. There are tests and screeners parents to measure that divergent thinking or that creative ability. Um, some other ways that we do is we can ask them to nominate students who they feel are exhibiting creativity. We have characteristics and look for us for teachers. We have PDs and we offer um, trainings for schools to help teachers understand that creatively gifted students are a little bit different and do require other types of activities. And so we give all the nominated students two to three screeners. We then ask teachers to do jot downs. And this is more jargon on our end, but I still want you to kind of hear the process. We use checklists. We might use a student work rubric. Obviously, students work can really show creativity. And then of course, any additional criteria. And then any student who passes our screeners and can produce three pieces of evidence between the screeners, the hope scale, all of these things you see here, that, per, that becomes enough information for us to identify them in gifted. So, this is an example of one part of a creativity screener. This is something we would ask the students in third through 12th grade or really 11th grade because we identify the year behind. So we would administer this to all students and we would give them 10 minutes. This is called a figures screener. 
This was developed by Paul Torrance. He's a leading researcher. He was a leading researcher in creativity. And so I just wanted parents to see it's not what you typically think of, like a paper pencil test, multiple choice, even a writing sample. Um, this is an excellent example of a figures screener, we call it. So let's take a look at a student example. And remember, we're measuring those four subgroups, fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. So as I look at this, we could start with fluency, and I can see that all of the boxes have been complete in this small portion of the screener. So that would be fluent. They fluently completed it. Nine sections were completed. Believe it or not, parents, we have kids who don't get past the top row. So for fluency, this child has met the requirements on this portion. Flexibility, how many different ideas do we see? We see lots of different ideas here, but I will share with you the originality is what hurts this example. Every single one of these nine pictures has shown up over and over and I have screened thousands of students. So this would not be an example of a student who would make it through a, a screener. Now let's look at another one. This is the exact same screener I just showed you. And I want you to notice fluency, they have all nine boxes have been covered. Flexibility is amazing in this example. I want you to notice they were not constrained by the lines. Instead of nine individual pictures, this child took three and made three or took three pictures each and made one picture out of three figures. So that's something pretty special. Originality on this example is extremely high. I have screened thousands of students and I have never seen this example duplicated, partly because these are fictitious characters. So it was pretty easy to be original there. I have seen an ice cream cone in this person's defense. So that wasn't too original. And then of course, elaboration. There's pretty good detail in this picture. The teeth, the, pipe, the um, cone is very detailed. Could there be more? Yes, but this would be one I would want to see an additional screen on. This next one, again, I hope parents you're following along now and think about it and answer in your own head. Does this look like one who might need an additional screener or is this a child that does not need additional screening? And I hope your answer is that they don't need additional screening. Once again, they were constrained by the lines. Every single one of these nine pictures is not original. I've seen them time and time again. So flexibility wasn't, there isn't a lot of flexibility. They were constrained by the lines, by the boxes, by the figures. They used very traditional shapes to continue not so original thinking. And elaboration. There is hardly any details added to any of the pictures. The chocolate chips, I'm going to call them, might be the most detailed or the rattle at the end of the snake. So you can see we're really looking at these pictures and diagnosing them. And here's the final example. I do want you to remember that this is the exact screener I showed you at the very beginning of the slides. And this is what we, this is an exceptional example. So first of all, fluency, they completed all nine parts. So they definitely addressed each box. Flexibility is amazing. Look at that. They were able to completely come out of the constraints of the boxes. It's almost like they were able to come up off the paper, see all those figures and compile one picture in their head and then execute. And then of course, elaboration. I will admit there isn't a lot of details. I have seen some pretty detailed screeners but this one is enough that we would certainly recommend another screener. So we talked about one type of screener. I kept using the term a figure screener, but we all know that some of us here doodling or drawing and it might make us cringe. I'm not that person, but I understand that that can be how you think. And so we talk to the kids. We want them to build on their strengths. So in JCPS, we wanna offer two different types of screeners. One is a figure screener, and the other one is what we call a word screener, or like these are children who have strength in words, or maybe they don't wanna draw is another way to think of it. And we do let the children pick their first round of screeners. Now, ultimately they need to show in creativity, 
that a figure strainer is something they can address. And I want you to keep in mind that it doesn't have to be artistic. It just needs to meet some of those criteria on our rubric. And so it is not subjective, all objectively being measured. And this is one of our other screeners we really like to use. So we again use this with third through 12th graders and we ask them a question and we always time this as you saw in the Torrance figures test, 10 minutes. This one would also be 10 minutes or five minutes. It just kind of depends. Um, and so we said, you will have five minutes to complete this task. You can begin when the teacher tells you. Imagine that you woke up one day with five arms instead of two. How would your life be different? List as many ways as you can think of in the box. So parents, I want you to understand again, you can see all my markups in my writing using the rubric. We're measuring those four subcategories, fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. So fluency, how many ideas did this child generate? They generated eight. And after screening thousands and thousands of children, I've seen upwards of 25 to 30 in a 10 minute time span. So you can see that's quite different than eight. So even as I've been learning, I'm realizing that fluency can really, kids can generate a lot of ideas pretty quickly. Flexibility, how many different types of ideas? So you can see I made my marks and this is hard to explain to parents and teachers really, unless you've had some education and gifted. But I'm kind of looking at most people when you're asked, how would your life change? You list tasks. Oh, I could iron more clothes and wash the dishes and brush my hair. I could hug more people. All of those things are tasks. But as you can see, this child listed a lot of tasks. That's the most important one she, or that's the most common she had. But she had an awareness about herself. Her shoulders would be tired because she'd have extra weight. That's a sensory perception. That isn't a task. She's starting to be aware of how people, her perception. That's what I called it, or an awareness. Um, a relationship. She can high five and fist bump people. Now, I know that's also a task, but this is involving others. And so in a way, I felt that that categorized it as a different type of idea. And therefore, I'm not going to walk you through originality. Her most original answer is the one I have highlighted. This was a teenage child, but she said driving wouldn't be 10 and 2. She'd have five hands. I thought that was so creative. I never saw that response again. It would be 1, 4, 7, 9, and 11. So you can see the child put a lot of thought into that. And that was an excellent original answer because I have not seen it again. So this is a child that would certainly be one I might want to screen again based on that original answer. Didn't have a lot of fluency. She might be a thinker, a processor. So we would want to measure some more. And then we go through the same process with every kid that we screen and we help teachers and we meet with GT groups to find these screeners and then start our filtering process. So after we've identified, um, services begin. And so here are some options. We do not mandate services. That would pigeonhole us, and as you learn in the gifted world, each student has individual needs, even creatively gifted students. I could be creatively gifted in the arts, and then my best friend could be creatively gifted mathematician. We certainly would not require the same services. So the Kentucky Department of Education just gives us guidelines. This is what they suggest, and this is also how we follow the rules in, in JCPS. So of course, creative choice board. We would want to give students on a bi-weekly basis or bi-monthly basis and a, a, a time to shine with their creativity. So choice boards. Um, I want to point out that this should be in lieu of the regular assignment. We want different work, not more. Classroom teachers use specific instructional strategies. We offer PDs from our office and lots of options to help teachers learn those creative strategies. There are lots of research done on this and lots of proven student tasks that really highlight creative thinking. We want to build again on that flexibility, fluently, fluency, originality, and elaboration. A lot of times in elementary schools, I was a gifted coordinator for a while in an elementary school, we would do pull-out rooms. That tends to be less likely to occur by middle and high school because of scheduling. 
but a pull out classroom is certainly a resource time and it's most common a service found in elementary schools. STEM and STEAM classes, middle schools and high schools are loaded with these types of classes. Um, I've even seen in some of the middle schools lately, they're combining art and technology with STEAM and STEAM classes. It's just been really amazing to see how that music has been incorporated into it. So people are really changing their teaching practices. And that does excite me thinking about my own experiences and how the world hadn't quite opened up to creative teaching back in the um, late 80s and early 90s. I guess I am going to date myself. And so, of course, visual art classes, if you think your child is creatively gifted in the arts. Mind mapping, Socratic circles by high school, excellent creative writing assignments in English class. And then, of course, I have to address our science and math learners. The science fair, specialized field trips, um, creativity hour, a lot of middle schools are offering that now. Passion projects, passion hour, passion classes. All of those are certainly services for the creatively gifted. Now, in thinking of terms of what can my student do outside of the day, there's lots of options. Um, one of our biggest um, services in JCPS is Future Problem Solving Team. And by the way, parents, my supervisor, Jesse, is going to post this link in the chat. So you will have access to this slides because I did include hot links for each one of these um, activities that has some explanation just to help you in your researching, make it a little smoother. And so future problem solving, excellent for creative thinkers. Genius Hour Club is a new thing that's fairly new, or at least it's new to me. I should be careful saying that, but it's excellent. Engineering clubs always, if you think they're more of the science, technological, um, mathematical, creative brain, you want to maybe turn them towards engineering club, Lego clubs. Odyssey of the Mind Club is amazing. I wish they had had that when I was around, or if they did, I wish I had known about it. Art clubs, of course, digital art clubs. Even Minecraft has been shown to sh really support creative thinking. So these are some activities that you can, and opportunities for your students outside of JCPS. The school day. And then of course, parents, we wanna make sure that you have resources for helping develop creativity at home. And there are so many activities and resources now, especially one of the very positive things I think about NTI is we have really embraced resources and technology. And so I want to be sure to share that with you. And so there are there is a website, that first one, Engineering at Home Activities, and it's Simple things you might just have in your house, which I do like. I don't want to go out and spend extra money, but it's simple things you might have. And it really challenges your students to think outside of the box, per se. Learning to code. Again, that is an amazing, amazing. I even learned something. I've learned I'm not much of a coder. It's not how I think. But I did really enjoy some simple tasks and now have a better understanding. And I think kids who are mathematical, it is right up their alley. And I had, when I was the gifted resource teacher in elementary, my kids ate it up. And um, if you just click that link when you're later on or tomorrow, it's a great spot. And they have, believe it or not, K through 12 level. I had first graders parents, so don't ever think your babies are too little, that were coding. And they did it better than me, sadly to say, because this is not how I think. Imagineering lessons. Disney has welcomed us into their brains, and this lesson on Khan Academy is amazing. Suggested level is middle and high school, but I think a really strong fifth grader could get through that lesson, and it's just amazing. Same one below that, Pixar in a Box. If you just get on Khan Academy, there's a lot of really nice resources. And then, of course, Maker Stations. Storybird is one of my favorite writing um, opportunities for kids. I would have loved to have had this if the internet had existed in, when I was a kid. Um, you get the pictures first and then have to create a story to match the pictures. It's sort of a backwards way of thinking, but I used it with English language arts students and they loved it. Um, and you can do it on your own, free, 
all of these resources, Lego challenge cards, Minecraft cards, even if you're not a technology person and you want just some good old fashioned scavenger hunt, very creative, you could create your own, have the kids create one for you or for their little brothers and sisters. And you can just now hear the snowball going. Um, my ideas start coming to me as soon as I see all these. I'm like, oh, you could do this, or you could adapt this. And that's the kind of thinking you want your kids getting into, that excitement. Um, NASA challenges, that's going to be for your high school, typically. I think upper middle school kids who are very advanced could hang with those activities as well. And then, of course, there is a whole slew of apps on Apple and um, Microsoft tablets that have creativity and they're known for their development. And so I encourage you to encourage your creatively gifted kids to build upon what they already love. And that is the end of my presentation tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to the WKU ladies and they're going to begin the presentation on leadership. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great evening. Okay, are we ready to go with leadership? You are. All right. Well, I'm Mary Evans and I'm the program coordinator at the Center for Gifted Studies at WKU. And I'm delighted to be here with parents tonight talking to you about leadership. You know, good leadership is so important in all facets of our lives and our homes and our schools and our communities. And our health, our well-being, our success and happiness are affected by leadership. And the leaders, the future leaders, are in our schools today. And we must devote the resources to make sure that they are the best leaders that they can be. The goals for this session, I want to describe leadership as an area of giftedness and explain the process for identifying a student as gifted in leadership, share examples of services for students gifted in leadership that occur during the school day, as well as describe some opportunities that extend beyond the school day. And then at the end, I will suggest ways that parents and guardians can encourage and develop leadership in their children. We will return to the definition of leadership in Kentucky law sometimes referred to as psychosocial develop ability or leadership ability means possessing either potential or demonstrated. So that's very key wording there. Some stu students are showing every day what strong leaders they are. Others, we see potential for leadership and it's just ripe for development. Potential or demonstrated ability to perform at an exceptionally high level in social skills and interpersonal qualities and some examples are given. Poise, when, we, when I think of poise, I think of that child who is comfortable in just about any situation. They have a certain amount of charisma uh, where they draw people to them and people want to join in what they're doing and uh, want to listen to their ideas. Having effective oral and written expression certainly contributes to that managerial ability, uh, that ability to organize things and um, that ability or vision to set goals and organize others to successfully reach their goals. You know, Ronald Reagan said, and I quote, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He is the one that gets the people 
to do the greatest things. And I really think that is just so true in leadership, whether you're a kindergartner on the playground organizing a game or a a senior in high school that is um, helping to plan an important event at the school. It's that ability to get others to motivated and moving toward goals. What are some characteristics of students who are gifted in leadership? And as a parent, think about your own child or children that you know. Uh, and we're not saying that they would have all of these characteristics, but they would certainly have many of them. The first one is a effective communicator. And you know, communication goes both ways. We're talking about the person who's able to share their ideas and present their ideas so that other people are interested in pursuing them with them. But we're also talking about the good listener that is willing to put their ideas aside and listen to someone else's idea of how things should be done and nurturing and supporting the, the ideas of others. You know, many times we think of our strong leaders as being those very outgoing, extroverted students, but we can also have more quiet, introverted leaders that are just as strong. Those quiet leaders who lead by example can be very influential in our schools and homes and communities. A second characteristic is someone who accomplishes goals. They not only set those goals, but they take the steps to accomplish those goals. Uh, they are the initiators that come up with activities uh, and are always saying, well, could we do this? Or maybe we could do this. Uh, they initiate activities in the classroom or on the playground. Um, and, and we sometimes say they actually initiate arguments, um, but in a good kind of way, although, uh, it can kind of get on a teacher's nerves sometimes, but basically they're the ones who are saying, could we do it this way? Or why can't we try this? Or what if, what if we did it this way? They don't just accept things as they are. They argument a little bit. They argue a little bit to uh, try to do things a better way. Good uh, students who are gifted in leadership are effective decision makers. They are able to decide, hey, let's do it this way, let's do it now, let's move it, move forward. And they can be counted on to follow through on their tasks and responsibilities. They are those dependable students that you don't have to follow up on and remind them. You know that if they say they'll do it, it will get done. And you do not have to give it another thought. Some more characteristics, they know how to utilize human resources. So they come up with an idea like a, like a food drive and they are thinking, okay, who would be good at, um, who's good at art that could do some posters for that? Um, who's persuasive? Um, oh, let's have them go ask the principal for permission to do this. Or let's have them talk to the custodian about where we can store our uh, cans for this food drive. They see what needs to be done and they're able to delegate responsibilities. Uh, they don't think that they have to do it all themselves. They have those really strong people skills of how to work with people. Uh, they um, know what motivates others to get things done. They know that some people, if I just say, thank you, good job, they'll work really hard, where um, others want some public rec recognition or somebody else, you're going to have to uh, pay them with a candy bar uh, to get them to follow through. So they, they really understand people and know how to effectively uh, get other students to work with them to accomplish their goals. As in um, the other areas of giftedness, there is specific identification criteria that helps us find students that are gifted in leadership. Uh, and when we are identifying them in the school setting, we need to have at least three pieces of evidence. And these can come from several different areas. There can be um, document of leadership positions. And these can be positions in schools, like um, you know, if they're a class officer or an officer in a club, or it can be a leadership position in a community, uh, like the child who um, you know, sees the, the homeless and says, let's do a, a, a food drive, or I want to go work at the food pantry and get other people to um, help me serve food at a, at a soup, soup kitchen. So it just needs to be documented ways that they are leaders, whether in the school or the community. 
letters of recommendation or other pieces of evidence. And classroom teachers see leadership, they can write letters, but many times they are asked over and over and over again. If your child is trying to put together some information, a portfolio for leadership, see who maybe outside of school could write a little a letter of recommendation. Some of the best letters of recommendation that I have seen have come from coaches and have come from community leaders who see these kids outside of school and uh, can write some really great letters. Then the other things listed here, like the leadership jot downs and the uh, hope scale, peer surveys, self nominations, I'm going to share some examples with you. Leadership jot downs. We have jot downs in um, all areas of giftedness. And basically what this is, it's similar to a checklist. We ask teachers to keep these jot down forms on their desks. And as they're going about their days, when they think of a child that fits in one of these categories, you write that child's name down. And then when the GT committee gets together to look at the evidence, they're going to look and see what names are we seeing over and over and over again. This is not just a, a one time that you do this, you do this over time. And in the area of leadership, what's listed in these boxes are characteristics. Some of these I've already talked about, like uh, the student who can get others to work toward desirable or undesirable goals. Student, oh. Let me go back. Students who are um, gifted in leadership often display a sense of justice and fair play that is very, very strong. They see the wrongs in our world and they want to make those right. Um, another characteristic is they may be frustrated by the lack of organization or progress toward a goal. They're just sitting there and they, they just want to take charge. I, I can get this done. You know, they, they have a certain impatience about them. So jot downs help teachers to be aware of the characteristics and then to quantify those. Then as kind of a message, particularly to parents here, I want us to think for a minute about learning the difference between leadership and bossiness. One of the characteristics on the jot down is said that these kids can sometimes be considered bossy and, you know, Bossy is not really seen as a positive thing. And many times children who really are strong in leadership can come across as bossy, unless as parents and teachers, we coach them a little bit into how they could do things differently. So as a parent, as a teacher, we can help our children understand that a good leader lets others have ideas and input, but they don't always have to make all the decisions. We can talk to them about how to share different aspects of leadership and delegate that you, you can assist, you can help, you can facilitate. And just really talk to them. What's the difference between bossiness and cooperation? You know, no one really wants to be around a bossy student, but we all enjoy cooperating and then providing outlets for those leadership skills to emerge. I think that E.M. Kelly kind of helps us understand the difference. A boss says go, but a leader says let's go. So it's that collaboration, that working together to move toward that common direction that kind of separates the difference between a bossy person and uh, someone who's exhibiting leadership. The HOPE scale is a very important instrument that is used in JCPS. And the important thing uh, I think of when I think of the HOPE scale is when we ask teachers to fill this out, we ask them to think about a student compared to other students similar in age, experience, and or environment or, or background. And so we're looking at uh, students who are self-aware, that show compassion for others, that are uh, a leader within their group of peers. And so we're not comparing them with all of the other kids in the school, but we're comparing them to other kids that are similar to them. Then peer surveys or nominations are an important part of the evidence that can be collected. And this is very simple. You just say to kids something like this. You need some help planning your birthday party if it's elementary school. Which students would you ask to help you? Children know, 
children know who's organized, who will get things done, who will make it be a really great party. Or here's another one. There's an argument on the playground. Which students would you ask to help you solve that disagreement? Kids know. So peer surveys and sociogram type things are other pieces of evidence. Then there's a leadership, or there's many different leadership self-assessments that the students themselves can fill out. You know, we've mentioned that these students are often very self-aware, and they'll be so honest on these. Uh, the way most of these work, this particular one is a, a five-point scale, with five being that I almost always, this is almost always true of me, a four being it's often true, three, it's sometimes true, two, it's very true, a rare, not, not very true, and then a one being rarely true. So the students rate themselves on whether they respect the opinions or ideas of other people, or they like to be a leader for tasks or projects, they, whether they see themselves as a, a leader in their grades. And so you can get some really good information off of that. So there are many ways to find students who have high leadership potential. But once we find them, then how do we serve them? And we must have two or more service options in the area of leadership, the, the more the better to better meet the needs of the wide range of kids. And the service options should give students opportunities to develop and practice their leadership skills. You know, you find children that have potential to be good leaders, and some children in that group have the charisma, others easily follow them, but they may not lead in the right directions. <clears throat> and so you certainly need to find those children and make sure you help them channel that great leadership ability they have into a positive direction. There are some great curriculum that teachers can use and parents can use this also. Uh, to nurture leadership development. This is a favorite of mine. It's Building Everyday Leadership in All Kids, uh, developed by Miriam McGregor. And she uh, has activities in her book that can be used with groups of students. And uh, it does a couple of things. It's a, a good way to see leaders emerge, but it's also a good way to develop the leadership skills of those identified kids. One of the first one of my favorites is called House of Cards, and that's where uh, you divide students into groups and you give them index cards. And then they are told to create a three-dimensional House of Cards from the ground up. They only have 10 minutes to do it, and they can't like lean it against the table legs or um, lean it against books. They can't have any tape or paper clips or any items to connect these. They just have to use the cards and get them to support themselves. And the real hard part is they cannot communicate verbally uh, to accomplish their goal. They have to communicate in other ways and they can't make any sounds to do it and they can't write to do it. So it's, it's very, very challenging. And so you're going to see leaders emerge who are able to overcome those obstacles and be able to do this. Here are some pictures of some houses of cards uh, that have been developed. And then the, the activity can even go further. You have all these teams around the room that are building their house of cards. Then the next step is they're given more cards and they are to connect the different houses of cards. But again, they cannot communicate verbally and it has all those same stipulations. Now, what's really, really important when you do these activities is what happens after the activity is finished. It's the reflection. It's the thinking about how we accomplish this. Did we achieve our goal? How did we communicate? How did we know when everyone was satisfied with what we had, a, had our, fi our final product? So it's all of that feedback and discussion that comes afterward that really helps to develop the leadership skills. The magic carpet activity 
is a really fun one that students enjoy. It's where you bring in like a big tarp or blanket and all of the students stand on that and then they have to turn that tarp over. It's, it's called the magic carpet. And the, the idea behind the magic carpet is that you're floating through the clouds, but something's wrong with the magic in your carpet. It's coasting downward and you realize it's upside down. And in order to keep it floating, you have the entire team must turn that carpet over. But to be successful, everyone has to stay on that magic carpet while turning it over. And if anyone steps off the carpet, they fall off and the whole group has to start over again. And then there's one other rule. Everyone must be touching the magic carpet at all times. So no lifting each other up during this. So think of the leadership that will emerge from that. And again, it's the discussion at the end that where the leadership development is, is really taking place. Handprints. It's a simple one. You just ask the students to trace around their hand and then on each one of their fingers, they answer one of these questions. Who has changed your life for the better? Who motivates you or keeps you going when you get down on yourself? Who supports you during the tough times? Who do you want to be like? Who cheers you on? And then this one is uh, particularly good for older students because they really can start talking about people who are leaders in their lives and have made a difference in their lives and how they find friends that are positive role models and what kind of a leader and role model they want to be. So there are some good leadership ideas in, in this resource. Then another leadership curriculum is Changing Tomorrow. Uh, teachers really like this one. It's based on learning standards. Uh, there's lots of critical and creative thinking skills in this and students are given an opportunity to apply these skills. My favorite part is it uh, asks the students to research influential men and women and very, from very diverse backgrounds. And then they do a presentation where they really share and delve into what made these people leaders and what were the influences on them and who were leaders in their lives. There are uh, books for this for elementary, middle and high school. So some great curriculum. As I was thinking about services in the area of leadership, one that I think is just so, so important is mentoring. Mentoring matters in developing leaders. Many times in our schools, we get our Family Resource Center coordinators involved in finding mentors for students, but it's something that parents can do also. As you're looking for a mentor for your child, kind of determine what their interest is. You know, are they interested in uh, mentoring, uh, being mentored by a, a someone successful in the field of business or, or someone in government? And you're looking for someone who's very positive, very creative, very forward thinking, a leader in their field. And the child can shadow, shadow them, they can spend time with them. And then again, it's that debriefing after the experience. Talk to your child about what they learned by spending time with that leader. What does that mean to them? What were the, the things that they saw, that the characteristics that they saw in that leader that they might like to emulate? Of course, at school, there are many opportunities for leadership. Many teachers, have a leader board and every student in the class has a leadership job. What the teacher does is they think, what am I doing that students could do? And there are many, many jobs that the teacher can hand over to the students, even kindergarten students. All students can have a leadership job, but by doing this, this is a good way to see your very strong gifted leaders emerge because they're not going to be satisfied with just doing that job the simplest way it can be done. They're going to want to change that job and make it their own. For instance, one job that's very common and that helps the teacher is for students to take the attendance. A child who has high potential in leadership is going to find a creative, innovative way to do that 
they're going to take that data and find a way to track it. Maybe they're going to graph it or find some way to display it. They're probably going to go the next step and say, hey, let's improve our attendance data and come up with some incentives or a plan to encourage students to improve their attendance. So the difference between everybody having a job and a child with leadership potential is the way that they develop that job. I, I think about a, a student in the school where I was principal whose job, he was the energy leader in the classroom. And the teacher's expectation for that was that he would make sure that the lights were turned off when the class left the room. Well, he had that leadership potential, even though he was a very young child. And he decided to expand his role. And as he went down the hall, he flicked off the lights in every classroom, not paying enough attention to notice if the class was still in there. Um, so uh, he took his job very seriously. The other thing he did was he made posters to put all around the school, reminding everyone how important it was to conserve energy and, and turn off the lights if you weren't in the room. Many times teachers ask students to apply for the jobs. And this is a great way to develop leadership because all leaders know that you have to sell yourself when you're applying for a job. And so this gives students some practice in doing that. Also, we want to make sure that there are as many opportunities as possible for students with high leadership potential to practice their leadership. And public speaking is a very important part of this. You know, it doesn't matter what field you're in as a leader. A student might think, well, I'm really interested in science and I want to work in a laboratory and um, develop um, you know, new kinds of vaccines. Or, but they will still need to be a public speaker because they will need to share their research with the learned society, the, the scientific organization. And so public speaking is a part of leadership no matter what field you're in. Competitions are another great way to practice leadership. Students that compete, you will definitely see leaders emerge, even though there may not be an assigned team leader, but those students that rally the kids and say, come on, let's have an extra practice and we can do this. And those students who can motivate kids to practice harder and to work harder, definitely leaders. Then of course, service projects. You know, we talked about in the jaunt down that uh, these students have a real defined deep sense of justice. And um, so they will come up with service projects and they will follow through on those and convince other, others to help them. So allowing and encouraging students to develop service projects is an important way for students to have opportunities to practice their leadership. Extracurricular activities are an excellent way to develop leadership abilities. And there are many, many in schools. These are just the ones that came to mind to my mind as I was working on this, the Student Technology Leadership Program. If your child loves technology and is good with technology, this is something to check into. Most schools have this. It's a, an organization that helps all the teachers and students in the school when they're having technology challenges. If, you know, most schools have one technology coordinator and they can't get to all those classrooms, but uh, if you have some students that are helping them when they have um, a time, sometimes it's before school, uh, sometimes it's, um, you know, during a, a time during the day when they have some time that they can help others. Academic team. I've seen such leadership develop with academic teams where students really take charge and um, assign people to research different areas. And that's when it's more effective. It's more effective when the students take leadership than when the teachers do. KYA and CUNA, outstanding for developing leadership ability. KYA is the Kentucky Youth Assembly. This is um, culminates in a three-day model of Kentucky's General Assembly that's totally run by the students. They go through the whole legislative process, they propose bills, they uh, develop their platforms, they run for offices and they campaign based on those platforms. Uh, 
in the past, they've really tackled social justice reform, mental health advocacy, great program for leadership. CUNA is similar, uh, but it's where students participate in international diplomacy. Uh, they write, present, debate, and vote on UN resolutions. So another good leadership development. Uh, in the earlier presentation, Jenny talked about Odyssey of the Mind. When students are involved with this, you will see leaders emerge as they're working on the different projects. Most schools have safety patrols, student ambassadors, peer mediators, peer tutors, robotics team. And then if your school is a leader in me school, they probably have a student lighthouse team, which is, is guiding the leader in me activities. The leader in me. <coughs> the leader in me is an initiative that uh, many schools are embracing. It's based on Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly successful people that most adults, particularly in the business world and the education world, are familiar with. But it has now been developed to be a part of schools. And I know many, uh, there are several Jefferson County schools that are involved with the Leader in Me. And the school where I was principal here in Warren County was a Leader in Me school. The Leader in Me in the schools program was actually developed by an elementary principal who was looking for a way to help her school that was struggling academically to improve. And she went to a Stephen Covey workshop and thought, you know, this is effective in helping adults develop their potential. Why wouldn't it work with students? So she worked with the Stephen Covey organization and modified um, some of those seven habits that adults use to the seven habits of successful students. And they're things like be proactive, begin with the end in mind, put first things first, think win-win, seek first to understand, then to be understood, synergize, sharpen the saw. And there has now been an eighth one added, find your voice. As a principal, I found these very helpful. Once students had learned and practiced these seven habits and we were all using that language in our school, it was very helpful in many situations, one of them being in dealing with discipline. When students would be brought to me and they were having you know, some kind of a major disagreement on the playground, we would talk about, well, how can we think win-win? How can we work this out so that you both get some of what you want? or let's listen to each other. What, let's seek first to understand and then, then to be understood. So I support schools that are seven habit schools that are the leader in me, me schools, but there is some confusion when it comes to gifted education. So I want to try to clarify that. <clears throat> the leader in me says everyone can be a leader. And yes, that's true. All students can be a leader. They need to be a leader, a leader of their own lives, a leader in their own families. But we need to also remember that some students show exceptional leadership abilities. They're not going to all have the same amount of leadership ability, just like not all students have the same amount of math ability or the same amount of music ability. Some students show exceptional leadership abilities and that needs to be nurtured and developed. And when I have talked with folks from the Leader in Me organization, they agree with my statement, but that's not really something they promote. They promote everyone can be a leader. The Leader in Me says everyone needs their leadership abilities developed. And yes, do, they do. And that's what the Leader in Me program in schools does very well. It develops leadership in everyone. But we must remember that students with high potential need services beyond what is offered to all students. And then another premise of the Leader in Me is that everyone has genius. And sometimes that's interpreted to be everyone is gifted. And we know that not everyone is gifted according to Kentucky law. There are some very uh, specific criteria that helps us determine who is gifted. So how can parents develop leadership? 
you know, schools can do a lot, but they can't do it all. And it certainly takes a partnership with parents. So as a parent, when I see that my child has high leadership potential, what are the kinds of things that I can do? Well, it's very important to provide a wide range of opportunities and encourage children to acquire broad interests because no matter what field you're in, leaders are going to pull knowledge from many different fields to be truly innovative and solve the problems of the, of the future. So we want all kids to have a broad range of experiences in their background to pull from. Another great idea is to involve your children in planning family activities, whether this is family game night on Friday night or whether this is helping plan the family vacation. Help them see the different steps that are involved, the, the research that's involved, the uh, economic decisions that have to be made, the planning and preparation that goes into these kinds of things. That'll all help them develop their leadership skills. Encourage them to have individual interests and to do individual projects. And one of the best things that you can do there is encourage persistence. Many times children will start something, but not want to finish it. When it gets a little bit challenging, a little bit difficult, they're like, oh, I'm not going to do this. But persistence and overcoming obstacles is very important. That's something that good leaders need to know how to do. And then, of course, modeling respect and objectivity and empathy and understanding are very important for leadership. And as parents and teachers, as we model that, our, our children are watching. And then there are many leadership opportunities in the community. Uh, 4-H was very popular where I grew up in a farming community, but I understand that there are 4-H chapters in big cities too. The Boys and Girls Scouts of America, lots of leadership opportunities, as in the student YMCA. I recently learned that the Lions Club has a, a program that's called Leo Lions Club and a whole program about leadership that many Lions were glad to share with you. And then one of the important ways to develop leadership is through volunteer experiences. And sometimes we think young children couldn't really help with something like Habitat for Humanity, but yes, they can. They can help pass out sandwiches or they can uh, separate the different bolts and, and tools or Red Cross blood drives. That really uh, encourages people that are giving blood is to see children helping out and entertaining while the, the blood donors are waiting in line. And then here's a, this picture shows young people helping with Feeding America, which is, is so important right now. So many opportunities in the, in the community to develop leadership. Finally, leadership is one of the most essential human talents. Uh, John Quincy Adams said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. That quote was on the wall of the elementary school where I was principal. And I just remember it so well as a, uh, just something that was so important in our building because inspiring others to dream more, learn more, do more. That's what leadership is all about. You know, we, we think sometimes that children are too young to be strong leaders, but many times they will be the ones showing us the way. They can play a very proactive and a very meaningful role in affecting key changes in policies and procedures in their homes and their schools and their communities. And we need to stand strong in providing the resources and the support that they need to develop their leadership skills. I'm going to move now into talking about the visual and performing arts and finding students with high potential and developing the, the potential that they have in these four areas. Again, the visual and performing arts is one of those five areas of giftedness. And we talk about music, dance, drama, and the visual arts when we talk about this area. Of course, we want all students to have a wide variety of enriching experiences in the arts during their schooling because the arts 
develop a better understanding of cultures and history and traditions. The arts are a way of self-expression and the arts bring so much joy and so much fun. And unfortunately, the arts seem to be an area of schooling that when there's budget cuts, they're among the first to go. And that's sad for all children, but particularly for those children that that's what is the best part of their school week is when they get to participate in the arts. We have a definition of visual and performing arts in our uh, Kentucky regulation. Visual or performing arts ability means possessing either potential or demonstrated ability. We've heard that before to perform at an exceptionally high level in the visual or performing arts and demonstrating the potential for outstanding aesthetic production, accomplishment, or creativity in those four areas, visual art, dance, music, or drama. Some children have a greater need in one or more of these areas. They have a talent that needs to be developed that exceeds what most children have. So how can I tell if my child is gifted in the arts? I'm going to point out some key words here. Fluency, fluency of imagination, expression, or physical movement. It's smooth when they are expressing themselves and flows naturally. A passion and an intensity for the discipline. It's, they live for their art form. They have the ability to manipulate the art form into deeper ways. They don't just accept it as face value and do it the way someone's showing them to do it. They're going to change it around and do it their way. A young child who is both able to replicate rhythmic patterns and create new patterns. This is the child who hears it or sees it and then does it. A child who's able to recreate a painting or a sculpture. A child who can compare theme and composition across different works of art, noticing things that other children wouldn't even notice. They, they want to put their own style on things. Um, these children have an understanding of music or whatever their art form is that comes naturally to them because their brain processes the oral information at another level from what most children do. And they are willing to put in the time and the practice to make it happen. You know, we, we've probably all known people who had talent, you know, whether in music or uh, dance, who really didn't realize that potential because they never developed the discipline to do the practicing and to put in the effort. You know, it's great to have natural talent, but we have to develop that talent and that, that takes discipline. Some of the characteristics of the visual and performing arts talent, you know, when we talked about giftedness in other areas, there've been some key words that we've emphasized. Words like early and deep and highly and intensely and an unusual ability. Well, those are true in the arts areas also. These are the children that very early people started noticing their ability to move to the music or their ability to draw that was far more developed at a younger age than most children. These are the children who want to learn the technical skills. They want to learn how to do it better and they'll, they'll focus and concentrate for long periods of time. They may be highly intro perspective about the role of arts in their lives. They think about the arts and they think about how they can find more time to do the arts. They're willing to break from traditions. They see different ways of doing it, you know, where some children are very content to have someone show them how to do it and then they try to do it exactly like the teacher did it. Well, children who have this special talent in the arts, they have their own style, their own way. They're intensely observant. They see things that you or I, if, if we don't have that talent, would not notice. And they have an unusual ability for expressing themselves through the art. They, they show their feelings. They show their moods in the art. So 
So we have identif identification criteria that's usually gathered together in a student portfolio. Uh, most of the time those portfolios are electronic. There must be at least three pieces of evidence. And something that is so key with the arts areas is we need the help of trained specialists. Now, JCPS is working really hard to have a music and art teachers in every school, and that is so important because in order to find these kids and develop their talents, we need people that have trained expertise in these areas because how we find them is through things like auditions, which where they demonstrate their talent, and you have to have a... a a training and an understanding of that. Uh, letters of recommendation are uh, can be used as criteria, but these letters need to come from specialists, people who really know what they're looking for. Awards or critiques of products and performances, and these are all put together in a, a portfolio. And um, like I said, these are often digital now, but it could be a box of audition tapes or um, paintings and, and drawings, but the key is having professional artists involved, arts specialists. To start the process, there has to be a professional recommendation. Um, this often falls on the teacher, the classroom teacher, or the music teacher, or the art teacher, but it, it can come from a community person, like a, a, a church choir director or a, a community theater director. Uh, there are checklists like this one, this example one here, that have characteristics like that we're looking for students who are motivated to study the visual art or the performing arts, that motivation is key, students who have aesthetic sensitivity, uh, creativity, uh, interpretive ability. So you need someone who understands these terms to fill out the recommendation. Then a teacher nomination will follow. I, uh, the, the front of the nomination form that JCPS uses is shown here and they would simply check visual and performing arts ability. And then on the form, the teacher has to give detailed behaviors or observation that le led them to make this recommendation. And here are some actual things that a teacher at my school said about a student who was very talented in the visual arts. And to give you just a, a little bit of background about this student, uh, he was diagnosed as ADHD and struggled greatly in his academic classes. Had pretty severe behavior issues, spent a lot of time out of class because he was disruptive. And we were having a faculty meeting where we were talking about characteristics and the um, we had an artist in residence in our school and she wasn't required to come to the faculty meetings but she was going through the room that we were having our meeting in to get to the copy machine and realized what we were talking about and couldn't imagine that this child had behavior problems and so she shared these comments. She said, Hunter is totally absorbed in creating, so much so that he doesn't pay any attention to what is going on around him. He takes his time and adds so much detail to all of his projects. Other students always ask him to draw for them. Well, that was like a revelation for our school. And other teachers thought, okay, this is the way to reach this child. And his language arts teacher, his social studies teacher started encouraging him to show what he knew in those subjects through drawing and through posters and through the visual arts. It made a, <clears throat> a huge difference for this child. So that, that speaks to many things. Uh, collaboration among teachers and teacher nomination needs to be done by a variety of teachers that know these children best. We also have jot downs in the visual arts. There's one for dance, there's one for drama, there's one for music, there's one for the visual arts. The uh, jot down in, in dance has many things, things such as uses his or her body as an instrument of expression, displays, displays grace and fluidity of movement, is one with the music, communicates meaning and feeling through movement. If we're looking at um, the music jot down, 
This might be the child who hums and sings throughout the day, is so sensitive to rhythm. They're the ones that are tapping on their desk in class or tapping their, their foot. These are the children who sing on pitch from a young age. They can match pitch early. They may make up original tunes. They remember melodies and can reproduce them accurately. They can harmonize without being trained to harmonize. It's like it comes naturally to them. So all of these are ways of finding evidence that these children have exceptional abilities in the, the, the arts. So what can schools do? Well, one of the things about the arts is there needs to be an importance placed on the arts in the school. If you have a child who is talented in the arts, you're going to want to make sure that your child goes to a school that values the arts. And when you walk into that building, that you see student art displayed and that there's just a feeling in that school that the arts are supported. It's very important that there's certified arts teachers, which JCPS is working to do. It's also very important that the principal has a philosophy that supports the arts because the principal or whoever is doing the scheduling might be a guidance counselor, or assistant principal. They need to do very intentional scheduling based on the arts to make sure that there are not conflicts. At my school, for instance, we had a strings teacher who served many different schools and was on a very tight schedule. And so as we were scheduling that, we thought we had it just right, but what we didn't know was that some teachers had changed their recess time and it hadn't become a part of the master schedule. And these students that were in the strings program were missing about half of their recess. Well, we found this out when we noticed about half of the strings class was not participating anymore. And when we checked with the students, they were like, I'm missing part of my recess. Well, maybe your extremely talented child would be willing to do that, but most children in elementary school will not give up recess for anything. And so we always wanna make sure that scheduling does not interfere with the delivery of opportunities for kids that are talented in the arts or any other area. Schools can engage students with the work of art and artists from many cultures. Very, very important that diversity of arts experiences. Schools must celebrate the arts. This can be done by having art shows, student performances, hallway displays. Uh, I know a school that has a wonderful arts gala every year and it's a, a, an activity that is greatly looked forward to and every child in the building has their art on display and it's framed and there's a theme and uh, you, you dress up and come to, come to school when it's not COVID time, to uh, experience this wonderful evening of music and dance and the visual arts. The school looks like an art museum uh, for the, the month that this occurs. Another way to support talent in the arts is to make students aware of contests and competitions. And there are many, many, many of these. Um, usually the art teachers and the music teachers know about these opportunities and will maybe have a bulletin board that has all of these opportunities on it so that kids who have that high interest and high ability in these areas can take advantage of these. An artist in residence is one of the best things that a school can do. Many times a PTA will become involved. We had several artists in residence during the time I was principal at my school, but the very first artist in residence application was completed by a team of parents. So parents can have a huge impact in this way. And once my school got a taste of the impact that a, a wonderful artist in residence can make in a school, we wanted more and then continued to make those applications. <clears throat> and then arts grants, if you can find them, they will allow you to do many wonderful things in the arts that the school budget just does not have time to do. But unfortunately, they're kind of few and far between. But uh, that's another way that parents can support the arts in the school is by seeking out those arts grants and helping with the gathering of the information and the, the preparing of those grants. Let me highlight some of the contests and competitions that I am aware of. 
if you have a PTA in your school, they have what's called PTA reflections. And they have a co contests for kids in six different areas, the visual art, photography, dance, choreography, literature, music composition, and film production. And kids submit their work. And I'll be honest, and there were some years that they don't have very many pieces submitted and they're begging for submission. So definitely something to look into. The Kentucky Transportation <coughs> Cabinet has an adopt a highway contest and they do a calendar. And so they have different age divisions. There's ages five to eight, nine to 11, 12 to 14 and 15 to 18. The each division winner gets a $100 gift. And then the first, second, and third place winners in each of those divisions, their picture is put on the calendar. And so that'd be pretty exciting to have your, your submission, your artwork on a calendar that goes all over the state. Unfortunately, that one just closed um, January 22nd. I looked it up, and, uh, but think about that for next year. Jim Claypool Art and Conservation Writing Contest. It has the art contest is for grades one to five and the writing for grades six to 12. First prize, $250. $150 is the second prize and $50 for the third prize. Again, this is another one that we were told it's many times they don't have many uh, submissions. And so children have an opportunity to uh, win because the competition isn't as strong. And then of course, being in Louisville, hopefully you all know about the Kentucky Derby Festival student art contest where students in grades K through 12 can create different types of artwork, drawings, paintings, collages, mixed media compositions and prints. So um, just go online and you can see the, the art opportunities there. And these are just a few. There are many, many more. Art teachers tell me that, you know, there's so many of them, they can't begin to provide time in class for students to work on these, that it's definitely something they can do on their own times. But what art teachers will do is make students aware of these opportunities. And sometimes there are competitions that children with talents in the arts need to be a part of that they wouldn't just automatically realize how the arts were involved. And this one is on the JCPS uh, webpage, Future City Competition. It's for students in grades six through eight, and it's where they imagine, research, design, and build cities of the future. Well, which of your students are great at imagining and designing and building? your students with talents in the arts. So you're definitely going to want them to be on that, that team. Uh, they prepare a presentation video to share what, what they've done. So you're definitely going to want your students who are talented in drama. Uh, the theatrical students are going to be great at doing a, a very compelling presentation to sell your idea. So many times, the students in the arts aren't aware of some of these competitions. The science kids are, the math kids are, but we definitely need the, the artistic, uh, talented children to be a part of these competitions. Services in the arts that schools provide. Uh, Jefferson County Public Schools has a visual arts task force that is working to prepare a list of possible services in the arts to schools. And I pulled these from that. Again, mentorships came out as a very strong uh, service. If you have a child who's talented in the visual arts, allowing them, encouraging them, making it possible for them to spend time with a, a professional visual artist and go to their studio and be mentored by them, very important. Schools will have resource rooms or pull out classes where they cluster a small group of children who share talent to have some extra time to work with the, the specialist teacher to develop their talent at a higher level, to do some advanced pro projects more advanced than what they would do with the whole class. Distance learning classes, KET has some great sculpting classes, the screen printing, um, things that your, your students could take advantage of. Independent study. 
an opportunity to explore a topic in greater depth in some area of the arts. This is, of course, under the supervision of a, a specialist teacher and would get it's similar to a mentorship in that they would coach and help this child develop whatever their project is their interest in. And then in Jefferson County, you are very fortunate to have some magnet programs in the arts and there's lots of information available online about those. Here's a question that parents ask sometimes. Can I support my child in the arts if I'm not an expert in them myself? Well, yes, you can. The first thing you can do is spend some of your time investigating potential opportunities. They're out there, but you have to find them and find the ones that are just right for your child. You need to be their personal chauffeur, <clears throat> transporting your child to those practices and competitions. Engage in arts advocacy. So important for your child, but for all children with talent in the arts, because if any area of schooling needs advocacy, the arts definitely does. Talk with the fine arts teachers at your child's school. They are a wealth of information. And once they know that you and your child are interested in these extra opportunities, the contests and the competition, they'll make sure your child knows about them. And then one of the most important things is if your child exhibits exceptional talent, then find an advanced arts program to build those good practice skills and to develop their talent and find the right fit. Uh, I've, I've known students who just didn't quite connect with a say a piano teacher and uh, kind of lost interest when they had some exceptional talent. So you need to keep working till you find that right fit, the person who will really develop your child's talents. Other things parents can do, create those opportunities for exploration at home. Yes, it can be pretty messy, but provide your child with the space and the materials and the, the clothing, the instruments that they need to explore the arts. Take your child to music and dance performances, art galleries and theatrical productions. Even if it's not your favorite thing to do, if it's theirs, make sure they have that opportunity. Seek out workshops and classes and camps that focus on the arts. There's many summer programs and camps that have arts classes as a part of it. I know our Super Saturday classes at WKU, the arts classes fill up very quickly because there's just not as many opportunities in that area. And think of your child's artistic expression as a mirror of their personality. The arts are very personal and really reflect who they are. And display their art, find art audiences for their performances, invite everybody to come see them when they do their plays. That's how parents can support. Opportunities in the arts, I've included several with hot links. You're very fortunate in Louisville to have these different museums and uh, programs that have rich outreach programs that you can take advantage of. Um, the uh, Kentucky Museum of Arts and Crafts have uh, children's fine arts classes that are in-depth art classes for elementary and middle school students. The um, Squalus Puppeteers, oh so fun, the puppets that they make and um, they teach children how to work with puppets. The Stage One Family Theater has a wide variety of classes and workshops and summer camps. The Speed Art Museum has programming that allows families to create and interact with art in many different ways. The Louisville Youth Orchestra I was reading about it and it talks about that uh, they have four orchestras, an elementary string program, lots of ensembles. There's over 350 musicians from 101 schools involved with that. The, the Louisville Youth Choir is open to third through 12th graders. And they say on their website, no singer is ever turned away for inability to pay for services. So that's something to remember and take advantage of. The um, Louisville Ballet, uh, of course, has an excellent program and um, classes for students. And then um, Canstruction is a very interesting uh, opportunity for kids. It's where they take canned foods and create structures and buildings and 
things from it. And there's a kind of a competition that goes with it. These are, um, of course, unopened cans of food and they have competitions among schools and businesses. And then of course, donate the cans and it, on their website. It just looked like such a great opportunity for kids. There are some free art lessons online. I've experienced uh, Cassie Stevens' YouTube free art lessons with my granddaughters. We did a, a kindergarten clay lesson where you make salt dough clay. And then uh, the particular lesson we watched, they were making um, pizza slices. It was really fun. Uh, this picture is also one from her website uh, where it's a, a sculpture, a paper sculpture. She uses very basic, simple materials. The McHarper Manual Manor is also a very fun um, YouTube. Li she has live streamed lessons that are free. The one that I watched, they were doing watercolors, watercolor fireflies in a jar. And she is, the, the teacher is demonstrating and modeling and she has a child next to her that's also doing it. And um, so it's fun to watch and see how the, the fireflies turned out so differently. There are free dance lessons online. Just for Kicks is uh, more techniques. And then the Born to Move is a very fun one. They teach kids things like taco nacho dance and the robot dance. Um, I, as I watched it, I just thought kids would love this so much. And then the last one on here is the New York City Ballet. And they have a Meet Our Dancers. Uh, part on their website that if you have a child who's interested in dance, I think they would really love this. It, they interview the dancers and the dancers talk about, you know, what, how they got interested in dance and what motivates them to keep practicing. And it was just so interesting. In conclusion, I will end with a quote that I think is so beautiful from Michelle Obama. The arts and humanities define who we are as a people. That is their power to remind us of what we have to, each have to offer and what we all have in common, to help us understand our history and imagine our future, to give us hope in the moments of struggle and to bring us together when nothing else will. I think that's the best way to end this presentation as we think about how we can support our children in the arts, it enriches not on only their lives, but our lives. And it takes effort, it takes time, but it is so important. Thank you, Dr. Evans, for your time this evening. And we look forward to our next session in the near future. All right, we are good. All righty.